going to talk about driverless wireless network and architecture for driverless car, and we're going to introduce Dr. Suresh Okar. Okar. So give him a welcome round of applause, and we'll get started. Thank you. I'm honored to be here to be able to share some views in terms of the architecture for the uh, driverless car. Uh, I also want to recognize my co-author, Dr. Desh Pandey from uh, VIT in India. If you can raise your hand. All right. Um, I think the driverless car has been one topic of significant interest, and there have been a lot of prototypes already in place. Um, and prototype, there's a big jump going from a prototype to a commercial product like any other product. So my intention here is to highlight what is being prototyped and what direction we need to go, which may be different in the sense of, uh, of uh, wireless uh, uh, network associated with, uh, with a driverless car. Um, let's see. All right, a quick bit of history. Um, we are in the driverless car, uh, uh, just like we have been talking about the uh, industrial revolution. There have been revolution here all the way from 1769 to, to 2020s and the latest has been innovations in electric cars, and the next is expected to be the driverless car. And there is a range of other um, advances which have happened in the auto or vehicle business, which I'm sure, as I've mentioned, these uh, slides are available on the uh, web so you can access some of the details. So I will highlight the few things that I think would be of interest to the uh, forum here. Uh, as you would expect, a driverless car is more than just reproducing what humans do. Uh, if you were, it was just a replacement of a driver, we may not like it. A lot of things we do, including things like we break uh, speed rules or do you know all kinds of funny business. So driverless cars are defined to have these basically six kind of functions it has to carry, all the way from emergency braking, cruise control, autonomous driving, and uh, things like autonomous parking. Um, my um, uh, our focus today is going to be focus more on the accident prevention part of it as a way to keep the discussion focus of how we will um, address the, the issue of the traffic associated with that. So key requirements clearly include uh, safety are uh, critical, um, ultra reliable, low latency communications, and that's for the uh, network. And also um, we'll have a whole range of uh, communication. Uh, it's not just generally like a sensor, low power wireless access network, but a range of communications because of the uh, type of traffic and the management that needs to be done. So the basic sensors and the data gathering as far as driverless, driverless car is concerned are summarized in this picture. Uh, I'm sure most of you may be familiar with them. So we start with GPS. GPS gives you a snapshot of the overall map. Uh, it, quite often it's static. It already exists for you. And Secondly, it is not able to decipher things better than about maybe 10, millimeter, 10 meters, kind of a range, one to 10 meters, plus a lot of things, things like potholes and whatnot, it's not able to resolve. So that gives you a context in which we have the ultrasonic sensors, generally in the rear wheel and other, other areas depending upon how you want to cover the blind spots, which augment the GPS information and resolve things down to about 10 centimeters. So the intent of the ultrasonic sensors is to locate the vehicle within a very very uh, high level of resolution. So that's basically what the ultrasonic sensors do. The radar sensors up front, um, I, don't have a, I don't have a pointer, right? But that's okay. The radar sensors on the right side uh, are the ones which are primarily to get an image of things and objects in front of the uh, vehicles so that we can avoid the uh, accidents. Video camera is to give you a view around the car of <laughs> objects, both living and inanimate and aminate, and um, that is part of the data that is collection collected. And finally, LIDAR is a, um, a laser, multiple laser beam based uh, using uh, rotating uh, mirrors, which gives you a, a view, the image view around the car. So those are the four or five sets of sensors that create data that needs to be processed. The primary processing can be done on a main um, uh, computer on the vehicle. You know, the, the car is almost like a, uh, uh, a highly intelligent computer on the wheel. Uh, 
um, and the definition of the main computer processing and data depends upon what architecture you want to follow. And this is part of the classic uh, contention in technology in terms of the um, trade-off between a centralized architecture versus a distributed architecture. In a centralized architecture, you know, you have a centralized decision-making processing quite often affected more uh, by issues of uh, latency and se security, whereas if you do locally main computer, the primary issue becomes the processing power and the weight and the cost of having a, an onboard um, a computer. So that basically is the context of what data we are collecting in the, uh, in the driverless car. And Intel has published a recent uh, document which again in an idealistic situation, you know, years from now, what we have to design for in terms of what data will be created by which of these units. And those are the ones we talked about earlier. And it's estimated that in a, in a rough calculations, we will have four terabyte of data collected per day no, not that every car runs for 24 hours, but basically that's sort of the upper limit that we have to start thinking in terms of what network uh, we need to be able to put, what kind of hooks we need in its even in initial implementation so we are prepared for the future. And, you know, one driverless car in that sense is almost 2,700 internet users. That's a kind of a traffic calculation that is used as a context. All right. So what kind of network would we use? Firstly, there is an internal communications within the vehicle itself, which is things like Bluetooth, uh, RFIDs for like pattern recognition, some part of it. So basically Bluetooth internal for internal communication. We have the GPS, which is a satellite communication. We have these 4G, 5G cellular system, allowing us to communicate with the cloud, uh, be able to send information that's needed and the information that you'll get back for accident prevention. And then you have a parallel activity that goes on for this and other reasons where we have the roadside units along with the cars around you and part of the architecture there involves mesh networking kind of approach where the cars themselves can communicate as well as communicate with the roadside units. Most of the prototypes uh, that we see and we will have listed some of the prototypes in place are based primarily on this dedicated short-range communication using Wi-Fi type of, of uh, uh, network um, and the upcoming uh, lot of focus and clearly the muscle that comes from the cellular companies is focused on providing 4G, 5G type of uh, cellular uh, solutions and just like the old story of Wi-Fi versus the cellular systems, I think we are reenacting similar kind of a story when it comes to what will be the future for the, um, for the uh, uh, wireless car, uh, uh, the driverless car, wireless network. Um, so what you see so far is what has been primarily prototype and what the, the cellular systems are trying to do, whereas we will find that as we compare them, none of them clearly necessarily meet uh, all the requirements for a driverless car. There are trade-offs. We'll talk about the trade-offs and what direction we may need to evolve for the wireless. So this is a fundamental architecture we're going to follow in terms of the union of what can be done. So this is a summary of what we've already talked about. You got the proximity area network. You got the first solution, which is called the uh, cellular V2 anything, that's V2X solution, which uses the uh, 4G LTE with its properties of uh, uh, bandwidth and latency. And then um, um, uh, it's, uh, it's low latency and uh, low latency implying bad, not good necessarily. And security is, is the issue, um, not only for the wireless, but also although its wireless part is good, the issue is how do you go to the network and how do you go to the cloud and how much of that adds to the latency and the, secu the security. The primary proponent of that um, architecture are Ford, uh, BMW, Dem uh, Dalmer, uh, Chrysler and, and uh, Qualcomm and Intel as the product suppliers. And then the other one, which is more Wi-Fi based, as you would expect, local area network and the ad hoc networking, including mesh networking, um, deals with systems where you have connectivity with others, wireless connectivity or communication within about 300 meters of each other. 
As you can see, for example, if you go to some rural sites where you don't have cellular networks, for example, then you may have to set up these roadside networks for towns or a lot of places where um, you have um, cost of putting these roadside units, uh, then you may use a cellular. So there is a trade-off there and we will spend a little bit more time on that later. So the local area network is called the uh, dedicated short-range short communications. Wi-Fi has defined uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, standards. Uh, the 11P uh, is one of the ones which is upcoming standard. And of course, there are also issues in terms of uh, these uh, operating, generally operating in the unlicensed band versus uh, cellular, which offers in the standardized license band, uh, how that will be uh, an issue in terms of the spectrum management. Um, Toyota and General Motors seem to be uh, following that path at the moment. Um, and just like the Betamax and VHS, one of them you know, may win or may become dominant which one we still uh, uh, will have to look at. And the other potential candidates in the, in the background is WiMAX, which not too many people are prop proponent of. So as we said, we will, uh, one dimension only we are going to focus in the short time is the probability of accident for these two uh, architectures. Time to react, humans roughly take, to, this is data from um, some measurements done is uh, two seconds and the advantage there is at least 1.7 uh, um, seconds if you use the wireless. So because they are able to detect and act faster. Distances stop again, automatic human um, re reactions and everything else takes a little longer. Uh, and we have the data here for 30 miles uh, per hour and 60 miles per hour. So generally you can expect that if you detect an object within that range, then you have a probability of accident. If the uh, object is outside the range, then the probability goes down. Time to park, 60 seconds versus, versus 20 seconds. Uh, fatal accident, the data indicates in a lifetime, the probability of a fatal accident is 0.2%, whereas 90% of the accident generally are attributable to human error. And if you assume an idealistic uh, machine uh, approach, then that brings it down to 0.02 percent. So the probability of accident goes down, everything being ideal. And then, you know, distracted, there are distractions like that's part of human nature. We some, see something interesting or uh, an advertisement or something and people get distracted, whereas machines have no nature, right? So consequently, those distractions don't happen. Uh, other distractions occur also. Driving experience usually if you are driving, you know, with people cut in front of you and people cr do, do this and that, we are generally a little alert and tense where, when we drive, whereas uh, if you are a driverless car, it's very relaxed and entertaining. You know, somebody, um, uh, a machine is driving for you. In terms of uh, customer acceptance is interesting. Uh, a recent survey said that uh, something like 70% of the families in U.S. indicated that they will not send their child in a driverless car because you know, they're not only concerned about is that going to get hijacked, what will happen, but they just don't trust it. So part of the uh, story for driverless car is going to be creating the trust uh, for, the, for the general public. So that's our rough starting point uh, as, as the data. So now we'll focus on these two um, uh, architectures we have, the cellular systems uh, um, V2X, and that's the uh, vehicular to anything that's like, it's also called IO vehicle, internet of vehicles rather than just I, uh, uh, IO of things or IO of everything. Um, so here is the data generation. We have some communication with RSU, for example, out of the entertainment and some of the non, uh, some of the differable data and all that is generally sent through the RSUs, local information about even things like traffic light uh, kind of, of uh, reactions, information, um, any potholes which suddenly exist in front of you. That kind of a thing is done locally, but what we are talking about here primarily, as I said, on the accident prevention is on the 4G, 5G network. Uh, so that is uh, along the, uh, the, the direct pass through the network, uh, through the packet network to the cloud computing. The other contrast on the right-hand side is the one where the primary uh, interface is with the edge, uh, you know, fog or edge computing is another term which is used nowadays in uh, complement to the centralized uh, 
cloud computing, but here um, some level of work is done along with edge computing or fork computing, which gives you a lot of decision making locally, and in few cases you may still have to go to the centralized information. So that, those are the two corresponding architectures. So we have done a back of the envelope um, calculations, and this is what we believe are the characteristics of these two uh, networks. Car processor, because of the fact that most of the processing done um, externally, especially in the cloud, the car processor for the cellular solution is limited. Uh, it's also low power, uh, whereas on the uh, other side, uh, we got to integrate the data from the sensors, et cetera, and do a fair amount of uh, pr processing. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, there is more work to be done in the car processor. And the effect of that is also on the cost and the weight. So current studies indicate that if you try to do uh, a real VNet DCRC for a, a completely, uh, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the complete uh, environment, then the uh, weight and the cost of the uh, battery is going to be uh, likely to be prohibited. So that is one negative, uh, major negative for, for the second um, architecture. Cost effectiveness, you know, shared centralized resource, much cheaper, high cost of car devices, maintenance, uh, especially the, the uh, computer. Um, the rough estimate at the moment is for the cheaper solution, uh, as a rough estimate is around $7,500 is the cost that the driverless car will add uh, to the actual car once you put the driverless capability. So that's a starting point. Hopefully as you go to economy of scale and everything else, that price may go down. Reliability um, is a little less for the cellular because you are dependent upon, unless you duplex everything, the packet networking, the, uh, micro, the links, and the larger distance travel. Uh, clearly, uh, even if the 5G wireless by itself may be reliable, it's the rest of the network that may add unreliability. So the estimate is four nines, uh, which is roughly translates into 53 minutes of downtime per year, uh, whereas the um, DCRC is five nines, which is about two minutes of downtime per year, duplex, assuming duplex uh, computer and all. Uh, so when we look at the, fit, uh, the accident, we saw that earlier, but that's 0.02% on the cellular, but because of the faster uh, decision making and local uh, clarity and resolution of additional information, more detailed information, the probability goes down. Uh, this is again rough estimates done based on um, reliability and latency. Uh, estimated distance to travel uh, to stop avoid accident at is about 225 feet versus 210 feet. Not that different, but um, uh, this, is, this is after you, you, you detect this thing. And primary concern in the first one clearly are network delay, delay and reliability, but the second one is weight, cost, power, and power consumption. Now many times, unlike uh, you know, sensors which are isolated and they require the low power you know, five, ten year of, of uh, lifetime, car still has a battery and it can still charge your computer, but even there, the size of the uh, battery to keep that, keep the computer charging may be much higher than what our current batteries are, unless you are in a Tesla or something. Yes? So cellular, 5G would be cellular, correct? Well, currently there are, there is also, 4G is attempting uh, the LTE, there is starting off with there is something called LTEM, right? right? right but I'm, so I guess I'm, my point is the edge computing meaning that you process the data at the edge versus sending it back to the cloud. That is correct. You would still have that with 5G or 4G, right? So that was the the cellular s cellular system does not rely on edge or fork computing for this application. It's all centralized in the cloud. So you send all the data to the cloud, which does and sends a decision to the actuator to, for example, stop the car. That's a fundamental difference between this and the other one which, which supports edge computing, right? Because you're taking all localized decision, localized processing. Were you put edge computing in the, in the ECU, in this model? No, either in the RSU, right? The roads, roadside unit oh. is your, and it's, it's a Wi-Fi kind of a based solution as compared to the first one which is a cellular. So cellular systems currently uh, like the, uh, what is the new, new radio network or something, NRN, NR, in, yes. yeah, NR does not support cloud computing. Uh, I mean, fork computing, which is edge. 
it can rely on cloud computing because currently you may know that in 5G even the the uh, a core is a virtual core, right? It's supported by cloud as a control and, and management. Same thing with the base station. But the actual computing for data coming in from uh, from the car is envisaged to be done in the cloud for the first solution. Any other question? All right. So then we look at that in some common way saying what is the uh, um, pros and cons between two. To the first one, weight of computing clearly is acceptable. The second one is significant. So, uh, you know, would the car be able to handle that level of, of weight? Um, the uh, power consumption acceptable and concern and so on. So basically you can see that neither of the solution um, is really, um, is, is completely acceptable and probably to fatal accident uh, you know, even if 0 0.001, and we should not be compared with what currently exists as human drivers, because that's not a benchmark, right? The benchmark would be zero. You know, can we go down? How low can we go down to probability accident? So uh, is there even further down we can go? Uh, distance to avoid and, and so on. So what it basically implies is that we should be able to utilize the positives of the uh, uh, cellular connectivity uh, and its advantages, standards and all that versus the low latency and lower probability of um, accident for the second one, and that will be the direction hopefully we want to go. So basically, driverless car overall provides 90% reduction in fatal accident. There are two primary architectures, the 4G, 5G based, and the, uh, the um, vehicle network DSRC based. Uh, both have their pros and cons, so we need some rethinking, and since both are, are impossible to use, what would we make them possible? So some kind of a hybrid solution uh, which requires uh, mesh networking with um, cars, in, even if you have cellular system and roadside unit, if they are present or not present, uh, reduce the weight for the onboard computer and improve the reliability of the cellular part and the cloud. So that could be some direction in terms of what could be a commercial network for, for driverless cars. All right. Come again, they are? I agree. So what, what it looks like is, you know, for example, it's sort of, I was mentioning earlier, it's that Wi-Fi cellular story, right? We can't rely one or the other, correct? Uh, in some cases, uh, Wi-Fi is, is a must. So some fashion, whether it's interworking or, or some other solution is needed because neither of them is exactly what we want. That's all the message here is. That is correct. That's absolutely right. Right? That's correct. That's correct. But then again, uh, you know, the 5G is a fundamental paradigm for current cellulars, right? We have the standard approach of, of, um, of the ubiquitous of all of our applications with contrast with the machine-to-machine -machine type of traffic, which is completely different, and the RCS that was talked about. So those three, so 5G is not automatically be the only one where the bars may be low. See, one of the attempt assumption in 5G is an initial deployment will be at a higher frequency, the millimeter wave, and they will be used for covering these highly dense, low signal areas. So in the beginning, in some level, we will have a hybrid networks of 4Gs and 5Gs to address some of these issues. That, not, not only that, major parts of the world, there are no lanes marked. How do you even drive them? Right. So there's a tremendous amount of background in terms of infrastructure needed to make even, uh, you know, hope of this to happen. Right. So, yeah. I'm done. Uh, I think I have a oh, last call, last.
sure. If cars are further from each other, then they're not an accident. Absolutely car. correct. So mesh networking is key part of this architecture. Absolutely correct. Even 5G is migrating a lot towards that because there's a lot of dense thing and they don't want to go up the base station and then come down again. So that, that communication will be much more efficient. Right. Thank you.